Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. Many thanks for the invitation to this beautiful part of your great country and for honoring me with the Barry Goldwater Award for Liberty. When I listened to Mr. Bolik now, when he started attacking bureaucrats, you know, my idea, my idea was that I am a bureaucrat as, as the president of the country. I suppose that he was speaking about me, but at the end, I understood that it's probably slightly different. So thank you very much for inviting me to come here and for honoring me with the Goldwater Award. Uh, I must say that Barry Goldwater is a name I esteem very much, a name I was aware of already in the 60s, in the dark communist days in my country. Um, in the former Czechoslovakia, he was at that time considered an arch enemy of the rosy era of building a communist paradise, which was, of course, not a paradise. When I looked at the list of uh, the past award holders, my heroes, Milton Friedman, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, among them, I was really impressed. I only hope to deserve being included in such a distinguished group of great champions of liberty. So once again, thank you very much. I must say, um, as some of you may know, but I'm not sure that all of you, this is not my first visit to Phoenix and to the Barry Goldwater Institute. I am not sure whether anyone remembers that. I was here in November 1997, and since that time I have now on the wall in the office of the President of the Czech Republic, the Goldwater Medal for Economic Freedom. I got it when being on a tour in the US, lobbying for the American support for the entry of my country into the North Atlantic Alliance. We succeeded in it, as you know, and the Czech Republic has now been a member of NATO for almost 10 years. We have had opportunity. <laughs> we have had opportunity to prove that we are a reliable partner of the US and other democracies in several difficult missions all over the world, including Afghanistan, and I must say that this morning I got a message from my country that seven our soldiers in, in Afghanistan were seriously injured. We share the same values and have similar motivation to defend them when necessary. Speaking about my country, in my speech, here, 11 years ago, I said, I quote myself, <laughs> here in, in Phoenix, but not in this resort. It was somewhere in downtown Phoenix. And I said that for me, the transatlantic community, community was never connected solely with one past enemy. It was based on ideas, not on enemies. And I added that the alliance is the military expression of Western civilization. I think there is no need to change these formulations now. When I was here for the first time, it was eight years after the fall of communism. We were still fully involved in what we used to call the transformation era. The institutions of the communist system were already replaced by institutions of standard,
parliamentary democracy and market economy, but the new system was still young, fragile, and vulnerable. Nevertheless, the revolution was over, and the less spectacular evolutionary process firmly underway. Now, it is almost 19 years after our Velvet Revolution. We can proudly say that the radical transition from communism to free society is already part of history and that we in the Czech Republic live in a normal, free and democratic country. We learned a lot during the communist era and we learned some interesting additional lessons after it came to an end. Because of, of four decades, 49 years, as was correctly mentioned, of, we, of um, communism, freedom is for us not something given something received when being born, something self-evident. We had to fight for it, and it gave us a special sensitivity to all kinds of erosions, violations, and potential threats that freedom has to face. That is probably the main reason for my so strong opposition to the recent developments in Europe connected with the accelerated formation of a supranational bureaucratic European structure called European Union. And this is why I so strongly criticize current environmentalism. Uh, I would like first make a few comments on the lessons we learned during our transformation process. Some of them have general validity. I didn't, I didn't want to talk about it, but several people here mentioned it to me. It's ridiculous. And I, after the fall of communism, my first political role was to be the Minister of Finance, who was responsible for restructuring of the whole economy. And one of the main problems at the beginning were the bad loans we inherited from the communist era. So one of my first tasks was the bailing out of our, <laughs> of our banks. And that was, that's very interesting to discuss this issue now, you know. Uh, I remember that um, my, my idea at that time was to help those banks. And I created the institution which um, I called the Consolidation Bank. And we transferred many of the bad loans to that institution which was organized in my ministry, in the Ministry of Finance. And I remember at that time there were many U.S. friends, advisors, consultants coming and telling me that it's a very wrong way of doing it, uh, that it's, it's, it's a socialist, if not a communist way of solving the problem. So, it's very interesting how the history repeats itself, you know. <laughs> Nevertheless, we had to, to get rid of the bad loans which were crea created in the communist era, in the 40 years of communism. In our case, it was not a normal functioning of the economy and a normal mismanagement of things. But I didn't want to speak about that, definitely. <laughs> I must say that we, in, at that time, we understood that 
in the moment of the transition. We understood that it's necessary to have a clear vision of where to go. Our goal was very, I would say, very, very Goldwaterian. Capitalism, liberty, free markets, democracy, which means no excessive welfare system, no positive discrimination, no political correctness, no dictate of cultural elites, and so on and so on. Something, I hope, it's not necessary to explain and defend here. We understood as well one important thing. We understood that political democracy and market economy can't be exported or imported. They must come from the inside, from the country itself, by means of activities of people who live there. In this respect, I must say that the role of armies and or of clever and good-minded advisors and consultants is very limited. We understood that the role of foreign aid is almost negligible. This statement of mine is based on many experiences, but we have an almost controlled experiment next door. I, I understood that a lot of you, many of you visited my country recently when we made pictures there. But the, it's quite interesting to compare East Germany with enormous financial transfers from West Germany compared to no such transfers for the Czech Republic. And the achievement of both countries in the same period were and are very similar. We understood as well that um, the systemic fundamental, profound systemic change is an evolutionary process, not a planned exercise masterminded by omnipotent politicians. And we understood as well that the speed of change is crucial, otherwise the resistance of various pressure groups with rent-seeking ambitions will block any movement forwards. Nevertheless, communism is over, at least in my country. We will hopefully never need these lessons again, but I would say that we face other threats to our freedom now. As I said, one of them is connected with Europe, or with the EU to be precise, the other with environmental, environmentalism and especially global warming alarmism. Let me make, <laughs> let me make a few comments on that. Uh, first, uh, let me mention our experience with the EU first. I'm afraid that the American understanding of the European integration process is not only very incomplete, but often wrong. What I usually see or hear here when it comes to the EU is an unstructured, unanalytical, and to some respect almost naive pro-integrationist argumentation. It bothers me because I consider the marching towards an ever closer Europe, which is one of the leading slogans in Europe now, a mistaken ambition. If, I, if I'm not wrong, the unification process in your country which started more than two centuries ago, was not based on a formula of an ever closer America or an ever closer union, but to quote your constitution on a more perfect union with an emphasis on the separation of powers and, and on checks and balances designed to protect freedom and democracy 
against the tyranny of the majority and of the government. This is not the case in Europe now. The undergoing changes in Europe, the shift from intergovernmentalism to supranationalism, as well as the shift from liberalizing and removing all kinds of protectionist barriers to a massive introduction of regulation and harmonization from above represent a non-negligible threat to our freedom. The losing of democracy in favor of pan-European bureaucratic institutions located in Brussels is a problem. It tends to restrain freedom, democracy, and democratic accountability, not to speak about economic efficiency, entrepreneurship, and competition. I would dare to say that, com I am not sure you would agree, but I would say compared to that, the Washington, the Washington DC is an almost libertarian city, <laughs> as compared to Brussels. <laughs> The EU gradually becomes the embodiment of post-democracy, which is something the free people should never accept. It's an easy proclamation on the side of an independent scholar. It's, I must say, a problem for the head of state of a member country of the EU. I am sure you understand it. Uh, and now I would like to say a few words about the third danger, environmentalism. In the last couple of years, this ideology, and I would like to stress that I speak about the ideology of environmentalism, not about the environment or about the protection of the environment and the intentionally created panic about global warming turned into the most dangerous vehicle for advocating large-scale government interventionism, for suppressing human freedom and human progress and prosperity. I am frustrated that it has not been sufficiently challenged both inside and especially outside of climatology. Many people have doubts about it, but remain publicly more or less silent. We keep hearing one-sided propaganda regarding the greenhouse hypothesis, but do not hear, do not hear serious counter-arguments and not only in the field of climatology. There is a special role to play for economists and other social sciences. Uh, I know that some of you have already seen my book, which was recently published even in the English version. The Czech title was Blue, Not Green Planet. The English title is Blue Planet in Green Shackles. I am not sure which one of the titles is better. Nevertheless, uh, I, I, I tried to explain my position in this respect and uh, I, I hope at least that the subtitle of the book is, uh, is understandable and gives uh, the clear message of it. The subtitle of the book is What is Endangered? Climate or Freedom? And my answer is definitely freedom, not climate. Climate is okay. I came, I came this morning from Seattle and when I was reading newspaper this morning with the nine hour time shift to you are very early up here uh, and uh, I looked at the, at the forecast weather forecast and um, 
And I, I, I discovered that the, today's temperature in, in Seattle is 62 degrees Fahrenheit. And that the temperature in, in Phoenix is 102 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. And it's really surprising that I intended to come here <laughs> with the difference of 40 degrees Fahrenheit and expect that I will survive such a great uh, difference in temperature. And I'm sure you know that the, that the, that the average, average global, that, that the global increase, that the, the increase of global temperature in, in the whole world in the last century is 0 0.74 degrees of Celsius. I must say that I survived 40 degrees Fahrenheit today and I am still I am still alive. It seems to me that we should not accept that just the climatologists are experts and we are we are lay persons. Uh, I think that uh, the economist should speak about the inexhaustibility of resources, including energy resources, on condition they are rationally used, which means with the help of undistorted prices and well-defined property rights. I think that we should prepare well-articulated and even to non-specialists understandable explanation of the very complicated relationship between different time horizons discussed in the economic theory by means of discounting. Uh, I think we should return to the elementary economic argumentation about the rational risk aversion which would help us to reject the fundamentalist precautionary principle used by the environmentalists. And we should return to the discussion of the positive role of the markets, prices, property rights, and of tragic consequences of the unavoidable government failure connected with the ambitions to control global, global climate. You know, one of the slogans in the communist era was that uh, uh, we should we should dictate the um, climate, wind and rain. We were laughing at it, but when I hear some of the arguments of current environmentalists, it sounds very similar. What especially bothers me is the fact that the whole game is already in the hands of people who are not interested in ideas and rational arguments. It is in the hands of a group of cli climatologists and other related scientists who are highly motivated to look in one direction only because a large number of academic careers has, in the last couple of years, evolved around the idea of man-made global warming. It is in the hands of politicians who maximize the number of votes they seek to get from the electorate on the basis of whatever idea they could profit from. And the idea of man-made global warming is very seductive and politically promising. That's the reason why it is loved by politicians. It is also as a consequence of political decisions in the hands of bureaucrats, again bureaucrats, of national and more often of international institutions who try to maximize their budgets and years of careers regardless the costs, truths and rationality. The role of international institutions, especially of the EU, is decisive. I must claim I was, uh, I was the only one who last year 
just a year ago, at the end of September 2007, was the only head of state who at the UN Global Climate Conference aggressively attacked the global warming hysteria. So I am sorry that... I am sorry that no one helped me, but I must tell you that uh, after that, in, during various cocktails and receptions uh, in New York City, after my speech, many my colleagues came to me and told me, you are absolutely right, it's perfectly, it's perfect that someone said something like that. And I asked them, why don't you say the same? Oh, it's not possible. It's, it's politically impossible to say. So I don't believe it's true. And I think I can demonstrate that it's possible to have such, idea, such ideas and to play a significant political role in my country and abroad. I must... <laughs> I am, must say that it's finally in the hands of rent-seeking business people who are given the existing policies interested in the amount of subsidies they are receiving and look for all possible ways to escape the standard functioning of free markets. An entire industry has developed around the funds the firms are getting from the government. I think uh, because of that, we have to keep repeating the basic questions of the current climate change debate. First, do we live in an era of a statistically significant, non-cyclical global climate change? And is or will this climate change be so big that we will really feel it and suffer from it? Question number two, if there is a climate change, is it dominantly man-made? Is it the result of the CO2 emissions and of human economic activity? Third, should a moderate temperature increase bother us more than many other pressing problems we face? And should it receive our extraordinary attention at the expense of other competing problems and our current attempts to mitigate global warming the best allocation of our scarce resources? And question number four, if we want to change the climate, can it be done? And what will be the consequences of such ambitions of ours? My answer to these questions somehow developed in this book is basically no. Um, I myself, of course, do not aspire to measure the global temperature, if there is anything like that. I like, I like the phrase made by someone, climatologist, when he was asked what is global ter temperature, he, he, he answered, is the same as the global telephone number. And I think it's a good point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I do not estimate the relative importance of factors which affect it. This is not the area of my comparative advantages. And as an economist, I know that I have to permanently maximize my comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. So that's not the reason to enter climatology. But we do possess enough evidence to reject the allegations of contemporary environmentalists that these questions have already been answered with a consensual yes and that there is an unchallenged scientific consensus about this. To declare that is morally and intellectually deceptive. We know with certainty one thing, the consequences of global, of climate changes, if there are any, will be solved 
like any other changes and challenges in the past by the market and human ingenuity, not by government masterminding. They will They will be solved by technology, by growing wealth, by human adjustment, mobility and flexibility, not by government regulation and taxation, not by a new version of central planning advocated by the environmentalists. Uh, I am convinced that fighting for freedom, as a summary, and for free markets remains the issue of the day. We may, some of us, be oversensitive in this respect because of spending mo most two-thirds of my life in communism. But I am sure it is in principle not about our personal oversensitivity, but about the real dangers we see around us when our eyes are wide open and not blinded by political correctness. In the moment of the fall of communism, almost 19 years ago, I would say I did not expect to experience such attacks on our freedom and such intensity and extensity of government intervention into my own life as I face now. When I am saying, what I am saying may look like a pessimistic conclusion. It is not. It is just a wake-up call to make a change. And now I have to say, I mean a real, a real change, not the one discussed in American presidential campaign. <laughs> We, we, should, we should do something um, and we should not accept putting various manipulative ambitions ahead of freedom and free markets. We should not become helpless victims of new progressive isms and of political correctness. We should stand up for our good old beliefs and convictions. I suppose that is the motivation behind the very Goldwater Award. If so, thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom Patterson, Chairman of the Goldwater Institute, and Barry Goldwater, Jr. President Klaus, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for your great message. It is now our honor and our privilege, on behalf of freedom-loving people everywhere, to present to you the 2008 Goldwater Award in recognition of your heroic efforts on the world stage in behalf of human liberty. Thank you, sir, and congratulations.